culture here at Ready Church. So I am speaking on behalf of Pastor C today, so I want to welcome you to Ready Church. We are in a new message compilation titled Say Your Grace. So basically, it's not about food. <laughs> you think about Say Your Grace. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a catchy way to talk about prayer. That's the, the subject matter for this morning is we are talking about prayer under the new covenant and talking about how to pray, you know, not necessarily today why we should pray, but how how to pray, praying itself, things of that nature. And Pastor C has asked me to speak today. If you would, please, this is nice, it's not weird, but if you would go into your phones and go to Google and type in JFK and his son in the, the White House, right? And the reason why is because we don't have a screen. I want you guys to see this picture that I have up in my notes. So if you could go to, go to your phones, go to Google, and type in JFK and his son in the White House or in the Oval Office. Type in that phrase. And what you should see is a picture of John F. Kennedy in, sitting behind a desk reading some papers, and you see his son peeking through the door of the Resolute Desk. And the reason why you said, what, what the heck does that got to do with prayer? So as I was preparing for this message, that picture kind of illuminated in my mind from the previous sermon that I seen from another man of God. And the whole reason why I wanted to share with you guys is because this is kind of a, a picture, a similarity in relation to our relationship with God. John F. Kennedy, if you're looking at the picture, John F. Kennedy, this is in October 1963. John F. Kennedy was a president during that time, and if not, probably was the most powerful man in the world at that point in time, right? And he has his son playing in, like, in the Oval Office underneath his desk and he's playing around, and his son is not far from him. The reason why I wanted to kind of show you guys that picture is because of the, the, of the stark similarities relative to our relationship with God. If we all know God's characteristics, God is all-knowing, God is all powerful. God is everywhere, right? And this God, who is all powerful, who is everywhere, who knows everything, wants a relationship with you and I. He wants a relationship with you and I, and he wants to commune with you and I. And if you look at this picture, John F. Kennedy was not far away from his son. He was close to his son, but yet he's still getting worked on. He's still busy. He's still doing whatever. And the point of me showing you that was that, you know, it's sort of a resemblance in our relationship and to just kind of show you that God wants you to see him as close. God wants you to see him as present. And God wants you to see him as always available. Now, the title of this message is kind of two titles. It's really one, but it's kind of two. So you can either say it, praying as saints, the title of your notes as praying as saints, or how you say to pray. And I'll explain that phrase in just a little bit. So prayer is mentioned at least 127 times in the New Testament. And then if you think about the different translations and different versions in the Bible, totally there could be around 300 to 850 mentions of prayer. So by me stating that fact, I'm just simply saying that God cares about prayer. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. And then talk back to me. God cares about prayer. So it would be good for us to estimate that God cares about prayer. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16, it talks about praying without ceasing. In Colossians 4, chapter 2, it talks about continually being steadfast in prayer. And then you look at 1 Chronicles 16, 11, it talks about seeking the Lord in his strength and then seeking his face. So we could make a case basically saying that, you know, God cares about prayer. God wants to talk with us. God wants to commune with us. So what we are addressing today is the correct way to think about prayer and praying itself. Not whether if, if it's okay to pray in the car or pray in the shower or if you need to pray kneeling or you need to pray standing. We're not talking about that. That's not, that's semantics. That's nobody cares about that. It's about how do we pray? How do we see ourselves when we pray? How do we see God when we pray, right? Now, if you paid attention to my title, the title says Praying as Saints. The reason why I titled it Praying as Saints is because over there are at least 15 references within the New Testament where God, through the apostles, are calling the church saints. 
right? And we'll read a couple of scriptures with that. But that word saint is the Greek word hagios, which means to be set apart and holy. So normally when we think of saints, we think of somebody that's like holier than thou, and they got on the robes and the cape, and they in the, the Catholic church and all this stuff like that. When God calls us saints, he's basically saying that I've set you apart and that I've made you holy. Another uh, scripture that talks about that is 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30, where it talks about how Jesus has become our redemption, our sanctification, which is another word for holiness, our righteousness, and our wisdom. So basically saying that because we have Jesus, then we, have, we are holy because of Jesus, we have righteousness because of Jesus, we have wisdom because of Jesus, and we're redeemed because of Jesus. So if you would turn with me in your Bibles to Colossians 1, verse 2, and we'll look at our first scripture. Colossians 1, verse 2. And it's a real uh, small scripture. Like I said, most of the, the New Testament is written by the Apostle Paul. And there's at least 15 times where that word saint is mentioned. And one thing Paul does sort of in all of his books of the Bible that he wrote, he, he writes what they call a Pauline greeting basically saying this is the way that Paul would start his letters and the way he would greet the church, right? That's why some people don't believe that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews because there was no greeting, there was no Pauline greeting, right? But if you check out Colossians 1 verse 2, it says, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Now notice, one of the first words that come out of his mouth is to the saints, right? So I did a message say two years ago when we talked about saints versus sinners and we talked about how as a believer if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you're in this room we are no longer sinners, we're saints we're not sinners saved by grace because it's oxymoronic to call yourself a sinner but then call yourself a saint at the same time you may sin but that sin is in Christ, amen amen, amen. amen. so what we're going to talk about today is that there are four ways to prove four, four ways to pray as saints, right? There's probably more than four ways, but this is not like a I'm not trying to give you a 10 step and this is how you pray specifically. What I'm more so dealing with today is your consciousness trying to renew your mind that when you pray to think about these things, all right? So the four ways I'll name them, I'll name the four and then we'll go one by one. So if you're taking notes, the four ways to pray as saints. Number one, you pray with sonship. Number one, you pray with sonship. Number two, you pray with access. Number three, you pray with proximity. And number four, you pray with the understanding of a covenant that you're under. So if you would turn with me to Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 28, and then we're going to get into the word. We're going to flip our Bibles open today. Is that all right? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk back to me. Talk back to me. All right. So pray with sonship. To pray with sonship is to pray with the realization and conviction that God is your father and you are his child. Now you may be saying, Drew, I already do that. Not a lot of people do. A lot, a lot of times when people pray, they pray from a standpoint where, okay, this is this is God and this is just me. And there's no identity when they pray. There's no understanding of identity when they pray. And the purpose of me bringing that out is just kind of shows just like, pray with identity. Pray with, like when you're talking to, when you're talking to God, don't look at God as just, okay, that's just God and I'm just me and I'm just over here and I need a little bit of help. No, that's your, that's your father. Amen? Amen. So Galatians 3 verses 26 says, for you are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So in order to be a son of God or consider yourself a son of God or a daughter of God, you must have faith in Christ Jesus. That faith is a prerequisite in what makes you a son, right? Now in the Greek, that word son doesn't just, is not just talking about males, it's talking about males and females, men and women, because that word just simply means one who shares in the same nature as their father, right? So when it says son, don't be alarmed, be like, oh, well, it's not, they don't say female, they don't say like, it's son and daughters. So it's son and daughters. It's talking about male and female. And it says, for you are all, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. 
There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So you are all sons in so you are all sons in Christ Jesus. So how do we pray as sons? A lot of times we approach prayer thinking that you know God is mad at us, or you know that God doesn't want to meet our need, or that you know God doesn't want to help us, right? But the reason why I'm targeting this today or right now with this first point is to kind of set a foundation that every single time you go to God, view it as if you're going to your father, right? Going back to that picture, looking at JFK and his son, that JFK Jr. could go to his son, could go to his father at any time and get whatever he needed, right? And a lot of times when we when we pray, when we pray to God, and I'm guilty of it as well, we, we're not thinking, we're just like, okay, maybe he'll help. Maybe, maybe he'll meet the need. Amen. You know, maybe, you know, it'll be all right. You know, maybe this, maybe that. But when you get that idea of sonship, and like I said, it's not overnight. This is a day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. But when you get that understanding of, okay, I'm a son, you won't shy away from talking to God. Amen. You won't shy away from talking, talking to him because Amen. that's your father. This is not, this is not just some random person or whatever. No, this is my father, right? And I'm his child. So another scripture um, for reference is Matthew 7, 11 in the NSB. It says, so if you, despite being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So when that word, it says evil right there, that's not talking about evil like somebody doing an evil deed. That's talking about sinful mankind, right? So what the scripture is saying, what Jesus is saying here is, how can, how how if if you being sinful mankind having the propensity to sin are still able to bless your children? How much more would the sinless God of heaven and earth be able to bless you? Yeah. Right. So that's something to keep in mind. And then you go to Romans eight thirty one thirty two. It says, "What shall we then say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare His own Son." But delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? So the, the precedent, what I'm trying to say is that God is a good father and that God wants to bless his children, and we should try to believe and walk in that, right? But then also, if you look at verse 32, it says, He who did not spare his own son. Basically saying, God did not withhold giving his son to us, he gave his son. And in spite of still having already given his son, which that's enough in itself, because if we have Jesus, we have everything that pertains to life and godliness. So he says, also with Jesus, I also still want to bless you. Right? right? Isn't that good? Amen. That with Jesus, we already, he already has given us Jesus. He says, with Jesus, I still want to bless you on top of that, in addition to. Amen. So the next thing is to pray with access. What do I mean by that? To pray with access is to pray with the realization that you have full access to God by his spirit and that you have a relationship with him and are acceptable to him, right? You're not cut off from access. One thing, I had, I had an example, I was gonna do it if, 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 I, if I had somebody, but this is a perfect example. So in the Old Testament, there was a such thing as a temple, right? And the Bible talks about in the book of Exodus how God said he wanted to dwell among his people, right? And because uh, mankind was still in sin and Jesus had not came yet, God could not dwell in his people. God had to dwell among his people. Mm -hmm. And there was such thing called a veil, right? So this is a perfect example. So there was such thing as a veil in the temple that cut off and restricted the access of the people to God. So imagine this is the veil in the temple in the Old Testament. God's spirit lies behind this veil, and God's spirit, you can't, I can't go behind this veil. You and I can't not go behind this veil, because if we did, us not being holy, we would die. Yeah. Right? So, if in the old covenant, there were such things as prophets and high priests, and the high priest would go into behind here, which is called the most holy place. Yeah. And in the most holy place, this is where the presence of God dwells. But because we are unholy, or man was unholy, and Jesus had not come yet, only the high priest was allowed to be in here. So imagine you today with your relationship with God, you talk to God every day. Imagine if that got cut off and God's presence lied behind here and none of us was allowed in here. 
Imagine, imagine if God's presence was cut off from us and God's presence was locked behind here, locked, uh, held, was held behind here, and we was only able to be outside in that foyer. How would that make you feel? Right? You wouldn't like it. You'd be like, dang, I was just talking to God this morning, and all of a sudden, it said, oh, no, nah, he can only be accessed behind this veil, but only I, the high priest, allowed in here. And the high priest had a really even stricter job because the high priest had to um, make sure they were they, they clean, clean themselves and they followed the purification laws in order to make it behind here. Because if not, they would have to tie a rope behind their, themselves and go behind here. And if they were dropped dead, the, somebody else would have to pull them out because somebody else was not allowed in here. Nobody else was allowed in here. So imagine that, right? But the whole point of me talking about access is because of the new covenant, because of what Jesus has done for us, God's spirit, it talks about uh, towards the end of the gospel when it says Jesus died, God's spirit left this behind this veil and now was able to be entered in on into mankind. Amen. So in the old covenant, God dwelt among his people. Yes. Under the new covenant, God dwells inside his people. Amen. Right? So, so turn with me to Romans 5, verses 1 and 2 in the New King James Version. So, in the Old Covenant, God had to dwell among his people. New Covenant, God dwells in his people. So, part of that access is knowing that your access is not cut off. You don't have partial access to the Spirit, right? You don't have to ask God for more of him because he's giving you access to 100% of it, mm -hmm. right? So, Romans 5, verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Where it says justified by faith, that basically means that you've been declared righteous by faith. As long as you believe, you are declared righteous by faith. Righteousness doesn't mean anything but you have right sin, right sin with God. That you can stand before God right now as if you've never sinned. Right? And he has given us that gift of righteousness. Moving on to the second part of the verse. It says, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, it says in the later part of that verse, it says we have peace with God. I don't want to skip over it. So that peace is not talking about a calmness or a tranquility. It's talking about like that you and God are cool. You and God are on good terms, right? And anybody ever has somebody owe you money and they start acting funny around you? So they start acting funny around you because there's no peace, right? There, with us relative to God, before Jesus came, there was no peace because the sin debt had to be settled. So what Jesus, what Jesus did on the cross settled that debt and created peace with us, with God. Mm -hmm. So verse 2, it says, through whom we have access. That word access in the Greek means, and this is the definition, it means that friendly relation with God whereby we are acceptable to him and have assurance that he is favorably disposed toward us. Basically, you God likes you. That access that you have now is a friendly relationship with God where you are acceptable to him and God likes you. And it says we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Yes. So right now, you and I, we stand in grace. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean that when we sin, we step out of grace. It means what they call the dispensation of grace, which is another word for error. Everybody heard of, like, we're in the digital age, right? That's basically an era where technology is going crazy right now, and we can do everything on our phones. That's the digital age. Well, spiritually speaking, we're in the age of grace. We're in the age of the new covenant. We're in the age of God's unmerited favor. And what it says, stand, you stand in grace, it means that when I do bad, I'm still in grace. It means when I do good, I'm still in grace. Yeah. It means when my mind is crazy and I just messed up last night, I'm still in grace. It means if I need a bill paid and I don't have it right now, I'm still in grace. Yeah. It means that if my mind is going crazy and I don't know what to think, I'm still in grace. Yeah. It means that I had a hard night last night, a hard night at work. I come home the next day, I'm still in grace. Right? Yeah. So that's what that's talking about when it says we have access. So you have access to this grace in which we stand that no matter what, you are in grace. Amen. The Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians, it says, in, all, in, in Adam all die, but in Christ all are made alive. So spiritually speaking, there's two places that people live. 
They either live in Adam if they're unsaved, they live in Adam. If they saved, they live in Christ. And there's no getting out of Christ once you get in them because you couldn't put yourself in it. Right? Amen. So next scripture. Hebrews 4, verses 15 through 16. I hope y'all are going to go into like 11 scriptures today. Uh, verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Listen to that. So Jesus is our high priest, and he can sympathize with our weaknesses, because though he was tempted, yet he did not sin. And then you go to verse 16, it says, let us therefore come boldly. Yes. Meaning, based off of what verse 15 says, he was a sinless high priest. He's our high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. Because we have this high priest, let us now therefore come in boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Yes. Now, how does someone walk boldly? I kind of imagine like a running back running into the end zone. And trucking his way into his zone because he knows he's supposed to be there, right? So when it comes to boldly, how I kind of interpret that boldness is basically walking in the spot like you know you're supposed to be there, right? Mm -hmm. That legally speaking, you have legal rights to the presence of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Legally speaking, because of what Jesus has done, he has opened up the door for you to have legal rights. Like, you're supposed to be in the presence of God. We are in the presence of God right now. You are supposed to be in the presence of God. You don't have to work to get into the presence of God. You are supposed to be in the presence of God, right? So that's what boldly means. Boldly means you believe you have a right to be there, and you have a legal right to the presence of God because of Jesus. Now, it says throne of grace, right? Now, growing up, I would read that scripture, and I was like, okay, therefore come boldly to the grace. So does that mean I got to walk somewhere? But the kingdom of God is invisible. So it can't mean that if we, if the kingdom of God is invisible and it's saying come boldly to the throne of grace, what that's basically saying that is that there is a throne, mm -hmm. but because the kingdom of God is invisible and God lives on the inside of us, coming boldly is not suggesting you are not in the presence of God right now, but it's mm -hmm. suggesting seeking God for that grace and that mercy that you need. Amen. So that's what it means when it says come boldly to the throne of grace. You are already in the, you are already, you know, in the presence of God right now, but that's talking about going to God for this grace and mercy to, for, to help with a specific need. So pray like you know God is supposed to hear you, but don't not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus has done. Amen. So when you pray today, after you leave here today, pray as if you know God is going to hear you, you know Amen. God is listening to you, and you know God is supposed to hear you. So the third point, praying with proximity. Pray, what, that, what does that mean? The word proximity is just talking about closeness. Praying with proximity. To pray with proximity is to pray with the realization that you are as close as you can get with God. That God is not miles away, spiritually speaking. He dwells within the believer. So God is not a hundred miles away. Oftentimes, you know, uh, growing up, and I'm guilty of saying this, I would say, anybody ever heard the phrase, from your, from, from, from your lips to God's ears? Mm -hmm. Never heard somebody saying that? Basically saying, you know, like they may be feeling some type of way about God, uh, God may not be, you may feel like God is not listening, but somebody says, and somebody says something good about you, and you're like, well, from your lips to God's ears, because we believe God is far away, right? And then a lot of times, how we grew up thinking prayer was, okay, I just say, I, I pray, and then in Jesus' name, amen, and then it shoots out of my mouth, and then it got to be strong enough to get through this roof, and then they got, you got to go through the building, and then they got to touch heaven's gate. And then God sends an answer back down, and they come back down the same way, right? But what prayer is, prayer is an instantaneous interaction between God and man. Mm -hmm. Prayer is an instantaneous interaction. The Bible doesn't give us any grounds to say, like how some people say, like, oh, I need people who can reach heaven. No. Everybody who is a believer in Jesus Christ who has the Holy Spirit in them can reach heaven. Everybody who's a believer, there's no, oh, my prayer is not strong enough. The Bible will talk nothing about that. Amen. So you don't have no grounds to say, oh, my prayer is not strong enough. You believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit dwells on the inside of you, you reach heaven. Amen. So prayer is an instantaneous interaction between God and man. So what that means is sometimes we might get the answer fast. Sometimes we might get it while we're praying. And we're like praying to God about this, and then he opens up your, he opens up your mind, he gives you something, you like, oh, and you, you stop praying. Anybody ever been there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, while well, you're praying and you're like, 
Oh, that is right. Okay, never mind. Right? And then there's uh, other times where it sometimes it takes a minute, right? And then there's other times where as soon as you pray, you know you got that answer, right? So I've been there. I've been, it, was a, it was a time I was thinking about it this morning. It was time in 2017 when I worked for Mecklenburg Park County Red. And I used to have to, man, I used to have to referee these little league soccer games, man. And they get on my nerves. I had to get up at the butt crack John at 6 o'clock in the morning. And I have to go up there and I have to set up these goals by myself. And sometimes my, my partner wouldn't come. And then I would have to get up there and set up these goals and referee these games. And then uh, set the goals back up at the end. And it was just a whole bunch of commotion and confusion and a bunch of stuff, man. And I remember, okay, let me go pray to God and ask God for peace about this and ask God to make this weekend go smooth, etc. And I remember praying to God. And as soon as I said amen, I felt it in my spirit that I was going to have a good weekend. And then I went to work that Saturday and it was peaceful. And I said, wait a second. I can do that. I got authority in Christ. I can, I can pray and, you know, not necessarily command my morning or command my week, but I have authority in terms of being able to take authority over the demonic activity and be able to take authority over those things and make that environment peaceful. You have authority like that as Christians. So 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16 says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Saying, do you not know that you are the temple of God? We talked about this example earlier. There was a veil. The Holy Spirit existed behind the veil. You are, and now, because of what Jesus has done, God is no longer dwells in temples made by man. Mm -hmm. He dwells within the temples he created, mm -hmm. which is our bodies. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to worry about trying to go to a physical temple to get into God's presence. Matter of fact, when we leave here today, this is this goes back to being a regular building. Mm -hmm. We make this building a church. Amen. Being in here, existing in here, this is the, our, the Holy Spirit being on the inside of us. We make it a church. As soon as we leave, the Holy Spirit goes with us. The Holy Spirit doesn't stay here until the next time we commune. The Holy Spirit goes with us because we are his temples. Mm -hmm. So Colossians 1.27 talks about how Christ is in you. And that is the hope of glory. So Christ lives in you right now. And because Christ lives in you right now, that is the hope of glory. So these are just references to show you that, yo, God don't just dwell in temples made by man anymore. He dwells on the inside of you. So when we pray, pray from a mindset that your prayer doesn't have to get above your nose. Your prayer, you, God lives on the inside of you. The kingdom is invisible. God lives on the inside of you, spiritually speaking. And you don't have to, you're not far away from God. You're as close as you can get. So last thing is to pray with knowledge of what covenant that you are under. Pray with knowledge of what covenant you are under. What that means is to pray with insight of the actual covenant you are under. And that takes into account what Jesus has done through the cross and the resurrection. What happens a lot of times in Christianity is that our Christianity is preached from an old covenant perspective and not a new. So, example, if we were all playing in the NBA right now, right, it's 2023, praying from an old covenant perspective while we're in a new covenant is uh, akin to you playing in the NBA with 1960s rules. In the 1960s, there was no three-point line. You know, the, the training was probably not as good as it is now. You know, the players weren't as good as it is now. And if the players of today were to play in the 1960s, they'd kill because of all the advancements in technology and the rules and regulations. So when you pray or you decide to pray from a perspective that does not take into account what Jesus has done for you, you are essentially playing basketball in 2023 with some 1960s type of rules. Amen. It makes sense to everybody? Amen. All right. So you don't pray from a standpoint that is before the cross, you pray from a standpoint that is after the cross. Meaning that if before the cross over here, you know, the Holy Spirit came and went, before the cross over here, everything was conditional, you don't go into the new covenant in which God has given us, which you're in right now, we talk about standing in grace, you don't go into the new covenant that you're in right now and say, okay, I'm going to pray from this standpoint. You're here. Mm -hmm. There's no need to pray from, from this standpoint. So some examples for you, if you want to look it up in the, in the scriptures, some examples of Old Testament prayers is 2 Chronicles 7.14, and another example is Psalm 51, 10 through 11. 
So 2 Chronicles 7, 14 is a famous passage that every Christian that most like old saints or some, some or younger saints too, depending on what you believe, that whenever something's going wrong in the world, you see somebody put on Facebook, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Basically saying like, oh, we need God to, to heal our land. We need God to forgive our sins. And in order to do this, we have to get everybody to pray and pray and have 2 Chronicles 714 conferences and things of that nature. <laughs> but 2 Chronicles 714, God was talking to the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. He was not talking to you and I. Mm -hmm. And the North Carolina can't get on its knees and accept Christ. No, neither can the United States. Mm -hmm. The United States is not a Christian nation. There's Christians in the nation, mm -hmm. But there, Jesus did not come to die for, for Israel no more. He came to die for Gentiles and Jews alike. He came to die for everybody. Everybody who can accept Jesus' sacrifice is considered uh, who Jesus came for. So Jesus did not come for North Carolina. The land itself cannot get on its knees and pray and ask for forgiveness. Amen. So there's no need to pray. Second, uh, Chronicles 7, 14. Secondly, Psalm 51, 10 through 11. I wanted to look at this with you. So if you would mind turning to Psalm 51 real quick in your Bibles on your phones. Psalm 51, 10 through 11, because I wanted to, to look through this because it's kind of crazy. So Psalm 51, 10 through 11, it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Anybody ever heard that before? Amen. Right? Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast, or what they say, a right spirit within me. Ever y'all heard that? Right? So we say, Create me a clean heart, O God. Mm -hmm. The book of Jeremiah and the book of Ezekiel talk about a prophecy of the day that we're living in, which is the new covenant, that God will remove our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. So why are we praying this? Amen. You don't need to pray, God, give me a clean, clean heart. Now, you could maybe ask God and say, God, give me a clean heart towards this person. Right, but your heart inherently is clean because of what Jesus has done. So you have a heart of flesh. So there's no need to pray that, right? Amen. So then you go to Psalms 51, verse 11. It says, "Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit away from me." How can God cast us away from His presence when, if we believe in Jesus, His presence is on the inside of us? Amen. Right. And then you look at the second part of the verse. It says, "And do not take your Holy Spirit away from me." The Holy Spirit has been given to us as a what they call a guarantee or a down payment until Jesus Christ comes back. Amen. So because Jesus has not come back yet, we have one third of our payment, right? We still, we don't have a resurrected bodies. We're not, it's not all in full yet. But because of what Jesus has done, he has given us that down payment, which is the Holy Spirit. So if God gave that to us to seal us and to say that I'm your, we, are, uh, he is, we, we are his children, why would he take away from us? So you can see why it would, would be stupid to pray towards this way today when the Holy Spirit is not going anywhere, right? And then some uh, references for New Covenant prayer is uh, Colossians 1, 9 through 12, and Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. Now, both of those prayers are kind of long, so that's why I'm not going to read them, but they don't say anything about God taking something away. They talk mostly about God praying that Paul's praying to God that God would remind the people of who they are and what God has given them, right? So when it comes to New Covenant prayer, New Covenant prayer is basically you're not asking for something that you already have. Mm -hmm. You're not asking God for more of Him. Mm -hmm. You're not calling yourself something that you're not. And you're not saying or believing one way, but in reality we're really the opposite, right? So the opposite, we don't have a, we don't have a dirty heart or an unclean heart. So we don't need to pray, God, give me a clean heart. We don't need to pray that because he already gave you a new heart once, he, once you got saved. So you don't need, don't need to pray that, right? So the goal of today was to just kind of set, set, the, stone, set the tone and set the, the atmosphere for the month and just really kind of show you guys how we are supposed to pray and how, how to view prayer relative to God and ourselves. Did y'all enjoy this? Amen. Okay.